And tonight, the grand crossroads of hope can be found on your GPS system on 6th Avenue between 50th and 51st Streets in New York City, site of Radio City, home to the 75th NFL Draft and the very first NFL Draft held in prime time. Just the first round only tonight, presented by Verizon live here on NFL Network. And welcome to the NFL Network set position right in the orchestra section of Radio City Music Hall. Okay, good evening, football fans. I take that as you're ready for a big night of primetime NFL draft. As you all know, this is our 75th NFL draft, and you all have made it very special. And we thank you all for being here. Okay, you guys ready to get started? Let's get started. I like that. The 2010 NFL Draft is officially open. St. Louis Rams are on the clock after one of their more trying seasons in history. We know that Mark Bolger was released a few weeks ago. It was supposedly at Bolger's request because he knew that the choice of Sam Bradford by the Rams was inevitable. Sam Bradford told our Deion Sanders on the red carpet, Mike Mayock, that there have been no contract discussions, that the contract, quote-unquote, simply did not exist. There's his dad sitting next to him. Is that going to be the biggest moment for the Bradford family coming up in the next 10 minutes? I really believe it is. And, Rich, I was texting back and forth with his agent, Tom Condon, last night. Tom verified for me that there have been no contract negotiations. And I really believe the reason why is St. St. Louis was open for business all the way to the final second. And I don't blame them. Like I said earlier, if somebody comes along and offers you their whole draft and you've got a lot of holes, you're probably going to take it. If they don't, you're going to sit tight. You're going to draft Sam Bradford from the University of Oklahoma, and he will be the guy, your cornerstone, to build your franchise around. With the first pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the St. Louis Rams select Sam Bradford, quarterback, Oklahoma. And Bradford gets welcomed by the slim Ram contingent here in Radio City Music Hall and the Bronx cheer from the rest of New York. There is Tom Condon, the aforementioned agent of Sam Bradford, giving uh, some hugs and congratulations to the very first quarterback selected in the first round by the Rams organization in the common draft era. That's the last team to have never selected a quarterback in the first, quarterback in the first round of the common draft era. That is now a factoid for the history books as Sam Bradford is the new quarterback hugging Gerald McCoy, who may come after him on a couple of Sundays in the future here at the 2010 NFL Draft. A very smart, accurate player. Smart player, Rich. Very accurate. Now, we're, we're talking about it. You're talking about going to St. Louis. I, I know he just got that shoulder repaired. I know it's fine. I, Dr. Andrews repaired my shoulder. But he, they have to protect this guy. Quarterbacks, I watch Troy Aikman take a lot of pounding, a lot of hits early on in his career. You can't let this guy take that many hits. think the city of St. Louis is going to think of this young man? I think that they'll welcome Bradford. They understand what a good quarterback is. They had Kurt Warner. They had Mark Bolger when he was playing at a high level. Texas and Florida. The reason those games were so important were two reasons. A, they were the most elite defensive players they played against. The national championship game against Florida, this kid lit it up. 26 for 41 against Texas. 28 for 39. And what's the one thing when you watch this kid play that stands out? It's his accuracy. 
In the 08 season, he played Mooch six games in a row where they scored over 60 points. He didn't get touched. You and I could be accurate in those games. The reason I wanted to watch Texas and Florida, he got the tar beat out of him. He stayed accurate. He hung in the pocket. He made plays under duress. And if you're a big-time player, that's what Do they go as expected with Indomitian? Sue, or is there somebody pounding on the table there for a left tackle in Detroit? You know, and then the quarterback, Matthew Stafford, may be pounding on the table, but you don't go out in the offseason and sign Kyle Vandenbosch to big numbers unless you're going to put the three technique next to him. And personally, I don't care if it's McCoy or Sue. I think they're both great football players. I think he's the guy because I think he's the model that Coach Schwartz grew up in. You plug him in, Kyle Vandenbosch is a better defensive end, and that entire Higher defense is a better defense. I believe that Martin Mayhew, too, is very well prepared for this draft. They're building a nice team over there. They're 2-14 last year with a very young team. Started five of their draft picks last year. They will start another four and five. And we saw Dominican Sue on the phone, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were just announced that they are now on the clock, which means the Lions pick is in. And with Sue on the phone in the green room smiling, it appears that the big-time Cornhusker with the second pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Detroit Lions select Indomitian Sioux, defensive tackle, Nebraska. Understand he makes this team better on all levels. A year ago, they get Lewis Delmas as a free safety. Plug him in. He helps out on the third level. Now what happens? This is a kid that will be stout against the run, will push the pocket against the pass, and the single most dominant college football game I've ever seen in my life was this kid in the Big 12 championship game against the University of Texas, 12 tackles, seven tackles for loss, and four and a half sacks. I've never seen anything like it. You go out and get the next Absolutely. best thing, or got it. Maybe better than Albert if you look at his pedigree coming out of college. They did a nice job in the offseason because they have the 32nd ranked defense in the league. They made that defensive line much stronger than it was a year ago. They're going to be a good on defense. They're not bowing, folks. Yeah. They're suing. They're suing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, got, it's, it's got leads this team in tackle. Led his team attack two years in a row. Oh, hey, in a two-gap system. Yeah, so in 08, you know, every offensive coordinator came back in 09 because he came back in 09. He said, I want it. He went in, he watched every play on film to get better. And that's why I like this guy. And I've never seen a collegiate player have it. He's strong. He's tough. I sat two, right next to him at the Maxwell Club Awards. He was ready for business all night long. You mentioned one guy, Mike. I'll mention another one, Jerome Brown. I played with him in college, and, it, and he was a beast in college. And when I watched this guy playing that play against Texas, that's who I was thinking about. Jerome Brown all the time. A guy that gets to the quarterback. You cannot run the football with this guy on the football field. It'll be he and Sammy Hill inside. He'll make Vanden Bosch better on the edge. They're going to have to get a running back in a corner later in the draft. But that young man that you're watching right now is a dominant inside football player. Hey, Mike, a unique situation when rookies come in, normally they take care of the vets. Vandenbosch might have to buy him something. <laughs> <laughs> he might have to treat Sue a little something. Yeah. I need you. Thank you for this. I He's the highest drafted player from Nebraska <laughs> since Neil Smith was drafted second overall That's by the name. Chiefs back in 1988 for the Lions. And now McCoy's on the phone with a big smile. And he's the one getting ready to hear his name called. That looks like a my draft experience is now officially over type expression on his face. And the emotion now overcoming him as we know he is a big fan of Warren Sapp. And it appears that Warren Sapp's team is about to make him the newest member. With the third pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers select Gerald McCoy, defensive tackle, Oklahoma. Such a neat moment to see people driven to tears by the selection of a dream come true. 
This is for Gerald McCoy, who goes to the team of one of his idols. Warren Sapp hoping to do for the Buccaneers what Warren did for them, which is fill a big time need on the defensive line, change a culture, and lead a victory parade one day. This guy's got a heck of a personality. We know he's a great football player, but uh, this guy's going to be one of those fun guys to cover as he progresses in his professional career. Well, as he makes his way to the commissioner, he gives him a big bear hug. <laughs> it sure looks like they're walking on air out there. Yeah, you say what you want about a guy like that. But big fella Warren was a lot like that, an emotional guy. He'll get guys to play with him. Redskins pick less than five minutes on the clock till we hear it. Jason? Yeah, Rich, I'm hearing indications it's going to be a tackle. There was a lot of Eric Berry talk, but when we get this pick, I'm, I'm told it'll be Trent Williams. So we'll see if that's how it goes down. Maybe something changes in the next few minutes, but I'm hearing Trent Williams will be the guy. Wow. And there is Trent Williams reaching for the telephone oh, as God. if right on cue. Hello. Is that Mike Shanahan on the other end of the line? Mike, what do you think? I've said all along, I think he's the guy that fits their, their zone scheme the best. I love Russell Okung as a football player, but this is the most athletic offensive tackle in the draft. You run that zone scheme, that left tackle on the backside has got to get the cutoff block. He's the most athletic, explosive tackle in the draft. He's got long arms. He's a pass protector. The only knock on this kid coming out was off the field. Why was he not dominant against average players when he was dominant against excellent players. With the fourth pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Washington Redskins select Trent Silverback Williams, <laughs> offensive tackle, Oklahoma. He went with his full first name there, I think. That's three suitors in the first four tonight. And if Russell Okong goes next, it'll be what, Rich? Five consecutive Big 12 players. And that's never happened. We've never seen one through five in an NFL draft come from the same conference. Shaking hands with Gerald McCoy, his college teammate. What a big night for those two guys. As he puts on a redskin hat, walks out to meet the commissioner of the NFL, charged with the responsibility of protecting Donovan McNabb in 2010. Lots of bear hugs for the commissioner uh, tonight. Uh, you just love it, man. Rich, at this point, I'd be quite surprised if it's not Russell Okun here. Another tackle to go. The Chiefs love him. I'm told Scott Pioli loves him. If a trade doesn't come along, I expect Okun to be the pick. And with the Redskins, remember, they don't pick to the fourth round. Still shopping Albert Hainsworth, though. They're trying to pick up a second or a third round pick, so they'll still be working the phones. I've said all along I thought the left tackle made the most sense just because you could improve the entire left side of your line by kicking Brandon Albert. But Eric Burry is the exact kind of guy that appeals to Scott Pioli. He's a playmaker in center field. He's totally clean off the field. He's a difference maker both on the field and in the locker room. He's a leader of men, and I think it's as much his personality and his ability to be in the locker room and a leader in a positive way as it is what he's going to do on the field. I talked with him earlier today, Mike. We talked about those exact things that you just mentioned about his leadership. He's ready to go to football, some football team, and now we know it's about to be the Chiefs. With the fifth pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Kansas City Chiefs select Eric Berry, safety, Tennessee. So much for Scott Pioli not picking a safety this high in the draft. Eric Berry's going out. The Seahawks are now on the clock, no doubt quite ecstatic that Russell Okun is there to plug into Walter Jones' spot with the future Hall of Famer retiring. For what he can do, 
what I'm most impressed about is he played in a completely different scheme this year under Monty and Lane Kiffin. They kept him more in the box. He was almost a linebacker. He covered man-to-man when they had to against slots and, and detached tight ends. He's got the speed of a corner, the size of a safety. The year before when he played the more conventional center field, he had seven interceptions. So he was a playmaker when he played center field. He was an enforcer when he was in the box. He's one of those guys that a defensive coordinator loves because he's not scheme specific. He can play in anything you want and he can stay on the field for 100% of the snaps. And it's only fitting that a player whose nickname is the fifth dimension is the fifth overall pick in the 75th NFL draft. And another pair home that's for the commissioner. Man. That's going to be common. It's looking yeah, like Yeah, that's it. That's common. That's great, though. <laughs> Last night, spent last night at dinner with his family, man, and it's just, it's just happy. I'm happy for this guy. I really am. I mean, I love talking with this guy. I just like the kind of player this young man is and talking with him on the telephone. And what I love about it is, guys, the NFL's changing now. It has been. It's a pass-first league. The safety position is more important than it's ever been. He can tackle when he's in the box. He makes plays on the back end. I'd like him to come up the balance more when he's tackling. Sometimes he goes for that kill shot and he misses it. He's a playmaker on the back end. And when I put the tape on against Alabama, I love his change of direction. No panic. He's a flat-footed read guy where he's not afraid to jump the, slot, jump the route because he has confidence in his speed. You don't see many safeties that will flat-foot read because of the confidence they have in their coverage skills. And some guys are more pro-ready than others based on their development and the scheme that they play in college. Monty Kiffin, who led that Tampa Tampa Bay defense for years coached the Tennessee. Kansas City, what should they expect? Oh, they should expect everything. Expect the hard work of a leader, somebody that's going to represent on and off the field, somebody that wants to win championships. Let's go to work, baby. I'm ready. Ladies and gentlemen, this guy has that dog in him. Watch out. Let's go back to you guys. <laughs> since 1980. Jason Lock and Flora has a report for us. Jason, what do you have? I was just checking in with an official with the Seattle Seahawks who says, telling me Russell Okun will definitely be the pick here. All right, so the defense right there, they're looking for a left tackle. They're looking for a playmaker in this draft and a left tackle that I don't think the Seahawks probably thought they were going to get. The only guy happier than Russell Okun right now is Pete Carroll and maybe Matt Hasselbeck. You plug him, you play him, and he'll be there for the next 10 years. And Pete knows that if they want to win, and they've got a division now over there in the NFC West that is, you know, it, it's doable, it's winnable. You can make some progress, but the key is to keep Matt Hasselbeck, their veteran quarterback, healthy. He's the key. He's got to play and stay healthy. This was really a no-brainer to pick a left tackle. My bodyguard on the backside. With the sixth pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Seattle Seahawks select Russell Okum, offensive tackle, Oklahoma State. As you saw, handshakes all around in the Seattle Seahawks war room, and now Russell saying, Coach, I love you, but I got to go. They just called my name, and the commissioner's waiting for me. He did not. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe the commissioner should interrupt on call waiting right now they're, they're, on his Verizon phone. We're giving him flight information and everything. We want you here tomorrow for a press conference. He forgot the drill. <laughs> it's been a while. Pete's coaching. <laughs> Let him go, Pete. It's not a recruiting trip. You got him. <laughs> Oakland's a four-year starter. The thing that start, stood out to me in the run game is his hip strength. He's one of those guys who can snap his hips on contact. Michael talked about the decleaters. That's because he's got natural hip flexibility for a six foot five, 307 pound road grader with 36 inch arms. The thing I don't like you saw right there. He's a grabber instead of a puncher. You see how the arms come out? No. He's the, but that's just a technique thing. You got to punch, stay within the framework of the body, but he's got really good feet, long arms. The technique can be fixed. You know what they do with those tackles when they reach instead of grab? You put them in a doorway. And if you try to reach in the doorway, what are you going to do? You're going to break both arms. You got to keep the hands in and pop. And remember, Brandon Pettigrew was the tackle. Russell Okung 
was the, te- that was the, uh, who was the tackle. And against Texas with Arakpo, he handled Arakpo pretty well, who ended up going to the Pro Bowl this year. The first Oklahoma State offensive lineman drafted in the first round since 1970. And so we're watching uh, Des Bryant's draft party. He's shaking hands with the Browns on the clock. I got to tell you something right now. I'm not. I'm not trying to say it's Des Bryant. Here's where things start to get funky. We've gone by rote so far. The six players that most people expected to handle the first six slots went there. Now we've got Cleveland and Oakland, and there's a couple wild cards here. Cleveland's been trying to get out, and it really doesn't match up with their needs right now. They were more active in free agency than just about any team. Keep a couple things in mind. They acquired Sheldon Brown, but he's 31 years old. They don't have a true number one wide receiver. They don't have a true playmaker at free safety. So you start looking at this, I think they're trying to get out of the pick. But if they have to stay, I think it's Hayden or Kyle Wilson, maybe Earl Thomas, and then the dark horse, Des Bryant. All right, well. uh... With the seventh pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Cleveland Browns select Joe Hayden. Defensive back, Florida. So Holmgren goes defense, and interestingly enough, this may have been the pick if Mangini was still the guy who pulling uh, all the strings. I'm sure he definitely had quite a bit to say. It's somebody else, as Clawson does not go to the Cleveland Browns. Instead, the first Florida Gator off the board is this young cornerback heading to the stage right now. And uh, I imagine with his slight frame, his bear hug will be a little different than the one that the commissioners received over the first hour and a half of this draft. Here it comes. about this kid is his physical toughness. If you want to pick Nitz, you're going to say he's a little stiff in the hips and he doesn't have elite corner speed. However, what he will do is he will compete all 75 snaps of every game. He might get beat occasionally in transition. He will be compete. He will tackle. He'll be one of the toughest corners in the league. 32nd on offense and 31st on defense, you have a lot of needs. So you can go just about anywhere. So does he try to trade the pick? I don't know, to acquire more draft picks. But he got stuck on the pick, so he probably took the very best player on his board. I know this guy can play in any scheme on defense. He can be a Tampa two-corner, roll up and hit you. He can play some man. He can play in the third. This kid's one of those class acts with a versatile corner, tough, and with good cover skill. Now you know with Joe Hayden and Eric Wright, you can cover. Raiders! Raiders, Mike. The fun begins. The unknown. Shall we just dive headfirst into that unknown? I think we shall. And, and again, I said earlier, I got them the last three years, but nothing's jumped out at me this year as a Raider pick. I said Anthony Davis, the, my third tackle in this draft. They have a significant left tackle need. They need to upgrade Mario Henderson and Khalif Barnes. They're number 29 in the pass game. They need to help their quarterback out with a playmaker. Could it be C.J. Spiller? On the defensive side, Pierre Paul has that Oakland Raider paw print all over him. And Rolando McLean also fits a need at middle linebacker, a big, strong guy that can run. With the eighth pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Oakland Raiders select Rolando McLean. Linebacker, Alabama. And all the Giant fans hoping that he'd be the guy anchoring the middle of that Giant defense will have to buy Raider tickets in order to see that. Rolando McClain is the Raider, Mike. What's that, Rich? Rolando McClain is the Oakland Raider pick. And I think it kind of bums out the Giant fans, maybe some Jaguar fans, but it is a good pick by the Oakland Raiders. You're talking about a 254-pound Mike linebacker that can run, that's that's played inside in a Nick Saban coach defense. He's instinctive. He's tough. He's a prototype 3-4 linebacker that will now play the Mike in the
in a 4-3, which means he's schemed the first, he's a playmaker, and that's a pick that I think will satisfy. With the ninth pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Buffalo Bills select C.J. Spiller, running back Clemson. Rolando McLean's name was announced. That pick was in. And the Jaguars have been on the clock for five minutes now. C.J. Spiller from Clemson is going to a place where they already have Marshawn Lynch. Fred Jackson seemed to prove himself quite capable last year with Marshawn was suspended and not really pulling up to snuff. And Marshall, you're, you're shaking your head. There, there, there are no C.J. Spillers. Uh, I'll say that. Those guys are good backs. They can get it done. But this kid here is dynamic. He makes things happen with the football in his hand, and, 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 and everybody doesn't have to be blocked for him to hit a home run. That's a playmaker. He's a three-phase player. Guys, get him 10 to 12 carries a game, throw him the ball five to eight times, and let him return kicks and punts. He will make plays for your team. This guy scores touchdowns. He moves the scoreboard. He was an All-American kickoff returner. This guy was an academic, Michael, yeah. academic yeah. All-American, graduated in three and a half years. So you know he's a smart guy and a gem of a kid. I call that when you are educated about blocking schemes. That's exactly you know what everybody is. up front is supposed to be. You can be patient and wait for that guy, if he's falling, to get to his man. He had 31 touches in the special teams game this year, took five to the house. Big games in the ACC championship game against Georgia Tech. 20 carries, 233 yards against Miami. Six catches, catches for 104 yards. The bigger the game, the better he played. And man, oh man, you know what? how many playmakers can join the AFC East? is now hey the guys. Jacksonville Jaguars at 10. The Broncos have been placed on the clock. I think they're going way off the uh, reservation here. No big name. Don't be surprised. Defensive tackles. Tyson Alualu. -Alu. With, With the 10th some... pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Jacksonville Jaguars select Tyson Alualu. -Alu. Defensive tackle, California. All right, Rain Man, the stage is yours. the time I put the first tape in against Minnesota early in the season. This kid played the five technique for Cal, but he's really a three technique. He's got heavy hands. He's a fast rising three technique. Great motor. He's one of those guys you can put him outside and he can play the run or press the pocket. You play him inside and he will overwhelm interior offensive linemen. Just as important to Gene Smith and Terry McDonough, he's a great character kid. He's a wonderful worker. He's a tough kid. And what this tells me is that when you pair him with Terrence Knighton, the big temple tackle from a year ago, Henderson might be on the market. Here's the kid in the senior bowl. Remember, I like him inside, but he can work outside. Quick hands, swim technique. In the game, here he is inside at the three technique where he belongs. Look at the little rip underneath with the left hand and shoulder. Presses the pocket, knocks the quarterback down. Watch this here. You might see why I love the kid. Bang! Are you oh. kidding me? <laughs> Tough, quick, heavy hands, push the pocket, great off the field. Rich, there's the first surprise of the draft. And we've had our first trade of the draft. The San Francisco 49ers have just leapt up two spots, swap spots with the Denver Broncos. The Broncos were on the clock at 11. The Niners have two first-round picks tonight at 13 is their first one of those. They have now swapped spots with the Denver Broncos in exchange of a fourth-round pick later on in this draft. Who could the 49ers be leaping up two spots to get in your estimation? Anthony Davis is on the board, correct? The offensive tackle right. from Rutgers. I believe that at this point, what the 49ers want is a Quinella. They want an offensive tackle, and they want a corner. So at 13, they jump up, and they get the tackle from Rutgers, Anthony Davis, and then at 17, come back and get either Kyle Wilson or Kareem Jackson. 
So I think it's either – I'm going to give you three. It's good. And I hate to do this. Sorry. It's going to be Earl Thomas, the safety, Derek Morgan, or the left tackle from Rutgers, Anthony Davis. I know Greg Minuski would love to have a corner and an outside rusher, okay, yeah. and make that defense a little bit stronger than it's been. Of course, the offensive tackle is a very good need for them. Joe Staley on the left side from Central Michigan. They do need a right tackle to plug in. Yeah. With the 11th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the San Francisco 49ers select Anthony Davis. Offensive tackle, Rutgers. He fits in perfectly. They can plug him in on the right side. 6'5", 323 pounds, 34-inch arms. This is one of the more athletic offensive linemen in this year's draft. What are the issues? He's physically gifted, but weight and immaturity. The weight because he's always had a weight problem since he's been at Rutgers. But keep in mind, he's only 20 years old. He's three years removed from high school. He's got to keep the weight under control. But this is one of the talented men, young men I've ever seen. We've got another trade to report as our draft coverage presented by Verizon rolls along. The Miami Dolphins traded out of the 12th spot. The San Diego Chargers leaping up 16 spots to come all the way from 28. Who do you think they're going to take? We've talked all day about 10, 11, and 12. One of the potential partners being San Diego. What are San Diego's needs? Nose tackle, running back. And I think the nose tackle from the University of Tennessee, Dan Williams is the pick here. He anchors a 3-4. He's the best pure nose tackle in this draft. And he fits a need, and he fits in for value right there at this place. It'll be interesting to see what they gave him. Probably had to give him their second-round pick to move up 16 spots. That's an expensive trade. But obviously, they've got a need over there. You think it's offensive line? It could be offensive line. It could be on the back end. They're missing the free safety. When you look at what they have, Eric Weddle is the in-the-box guy on the back end. They don't have a guy. Gregory, they tried to play him last year. The corners were, were struggling because they had to play a lot of man with no help over the top. They were trying to help him underneath. So safety, nose tackle is, is, is definitely a need. And how about Marion? Merriman. They can use a pass rusher here, too, if they figure Merriman might not come back or try to hold out because of the, the whole labor agreement thing. You mentioned Ryan Matthews. How, how, how real is it him in this spot right here? You said no. they need a running back. Too high for him, man. Too high for Ryan Matthews. I really believe since they cut, they trade, excuse me, they released Jamal Williams, their nose tackle, he makes the most sense. You, you're right about safety. Earl Thomas would make some sense here. With the 12th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the San Diego Chargers select Ryan Matthews, running back, Fresno State. So is the running back. Wow. Wow. Ryan Matthews from Fresno had a phenomenal season last year. It was the first year that he was mostly healthy the entire year. He tested well. He's got more balance than any back the combination of balance and power this year, but he needs to stay healthy. He's never had a full year healthy where he didn't miss a football game. And Rich, you asked me who they would take here. Michael, you said could they take Ryan Matthews? My question to the Chargers would be, you had to believe that somebody was going to be taking Ryan Matthews in the next couple picks to come this far because there's nobody, hardly anybody believed this kid was going to go before number 20 and the Houston Oilers at the earliest. But I understand Houston, how, important, Texans, I, so far, how important that running back is to Noah Turner in his system. Like, take a look at what it cost him. It cost him a, a two and a four. To, and they do, however, get Tim, Tobin, uh, Tim Dobbins as well. The Chargers get an actual player. And I've just been told the Eagles are now on the clock. That's the safety. That's Earl Thomas. That would be the safety. They have now traded with the Broncos, who have fallen down from 11 to 13, and now dropped down from 13 all the way to 24, as we have 
seen trades now. The first nine picks in this draft, in case you're just joining us, it only took 50-some-odd minutes for those nine picks to go off the board. And then at 10, the Jacksonville Jaguars shocked everybody by tasting, taking Tyson Alu-Alu and then come three trades. You think this is for Earl Thomas because the Eagles knew that he was going to be uh, out there for a lot of people to go grab. Yeah, I've taken heat in Philly for the last couple months. That was my pick all along. He fits their defense. Macho Harris is not ready. Marlon Jackson is, has health issues. They need a free safety. They need a playmaker. Most people don't think Andy Reid will take that position in the first round of a draft. I think the league has changed, and I think he's the pick. Welcome back as the Philadelphia Eagles have traded their 24th overall pick to swap spots with the Broncos and two third round picks. You know, they had 11 draft picks coming in. Mike Lombardi is reporting they are not doing this for Earl Thomas. He says they are doing this to select Brandon Graham out of Michigan. I'm a little bit stunned because I really did think that he made so much sense. Now, they need a pass rusher to pair with Trent, Trent Cole. Cole. They got Daryl Tapp. They got Chris Clemens. They're not the answer getting to the quarterback. They've got another undersized, quick twitch pass rusher, but his motor never stops. It's an interesting pick giving up what they gave up to come from 24 to 13. Again, I think it's a little expensive to go get him that early. I think you could have gotten him later, but they well, want their guy. If, if you're Philadelphia in Dallas, you got a quarterback in Romo, you need to get him on the ground. You got Dallas McNabb over in Washington, you need to get him on the ground. You need to get Eli on the ground. We, we keep saying this, and it, and it shouldn't surprise us when teams move up and they want to get a guy to sack the quarterback. With the 13th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select Brandon Graham, defensive end, Michigan. There he is, Mike. And our guy for Bonnie. He's only 6'1 and 3'8, 268 pounds. He's tightly wound with very short arms, which worried some deep. He's schemed the burst. He can play 3-4 front or 4-3 front. He's got a phenomenal move. And I think year one in Philadelphia, he's a situational pass rusher. Watch him with his quick burst working against Welsh from Vanderbilt. Right there, gets the hands, dips under. That's an athletic mismatch right there. Against Vladimir Dukas, sets him up outside, rips underneath. He was unblockable the entire senior bowl week. Here he is again, spin move, showing some versatility in his rush. In the game, coming off the edge. Again, look at the hand usage and now the explosion, the vision on the quarterback, the close. Nobody blocked him this entire week. I I love this play because it's athleticism. Misdirection toss, you don't let him outside, you force him back in, you make the tackle. That's a highly athletic play for a defensive end to make in space against a running back. So when you look at the pieces of the puzzle for the Philadelphia Eagles, last year, their defensive starters in the middle, Patterson and Bunkley on the edges, Cole and Juquay Parker. I don't think he's going to start, but I think he'll be a situational pass rusher and he'll form with Trent Cole to give them some tremendous options. And with Earl Thomas sitting out there, Michael Lombardi says that's who Pete Carroll is going to go grab right now. Yeah, I thought it was going to be either Des Bryant or Earl Thomas. And you got to remember they were number 30 against the pass a year ago. And from where I come from, Earl Thomas is the best safety in the country. I've had him number one on my board the entire time. I love Eric Burry, but I think Earl Thomas is the most instinctive safety I've seen on tape in the last 10 years that I've been watching tape. So I expect this young man, if he stays healthy, I expect Earl Thomas to be one of the best free safeties in the Ed Reed mold. Instinctive center fielder, come off the hatch and make plays. With the 14th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Seattle Seahawks select Earl Thomas, defensive back, Texas. Five foot ten, 208 at the combine, 202 at his pro day. I think that's a better weight for him. Three-year player, he redshirted as a freshman. He had eight interceptions. He's the most instinctive safety I've seen on tape. He's a playmaker on defense. I fully 
expect he'll step in day one and begin to make plays. Why? His quickness, his change of direction skills. People say, how consistent a tackler is he? I'll give up, a, and by the way, he's a tough kid, but I'll give up a little bit in the run game in the NFL of today to get an instinctive playmaker on the back end. Eight interceptions this year and sophomore year, and the people that worry about his durability, 24 starts, 24 finishes. But you see those interceptions? Coach, it's one thing to get to intercept the ball and somebody says first down the other way. You're watching this guy get interceptions and take them all the way back. That what we that thing we call pick six. That's a difference maker. That's what Ed Reed does. That's what Troy Palomalu does. Those are the guys who, that you want on your football team. Now it's the Giants. Who are they going to try and get with Rolando McClain way gone when the Raiders took him off the board at eight? They were number 30 last year in points allowed on defense. So you got to figure defense. Dan Williams, the defensive tackle. The two defensive ends, Pierre Paul, who looks a lot like you, Manura, and that collection of athletes they have. If not him, maybe Derek Morgan. You had a good thought, Michael, right? Yeah, but for the Giants? Yeah, you were on Morgan and Weatherspoon. I love Morgan, I love Witherspoon, but you know, the Giants are going to be playing the Cowboys. Oh, come on. Don't All right, I'm sorry. I won't and mess it, with but that. The one other thing, though, is, is the tight end, Jermaine Gresham. Gresham. Okay, he's a guy that can help Eli a lot and take some pressure off the edge game. With the 15th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the New York Giants select Jason Pierre-Paul, defensive end, South Florida. So the Giants fans love him. It crushes the Tennessee Titans who are right there on the clock next. You really have their eye on this young man. But uh, they call South Florida New York South, and he's going to New York City proper now. He's a physically gifted kid. Look at all that. He ran his 40 under 4-7 on his pro day at 270 pounds. Explosive physical talent. Raw inexperience two years as a junior college player one year at South Florida but his explosiveness his Ooh. ability to get to the quarterback his burst off the line of scrimmage guys he can finish and I'll tell you what put the game tape on against Pitt Pitt has a tight end that ate his lunch in the first half of the game and in the second half he came back he dominated he continued to play with motor now this is a YouTube sensation at 270 pounds he had a bet with his linebacker buddy Keon Wilson who could do the most backflips are you kidding me now you don't draft a guy because of that but that's pretty freaking impressive <laughs> And you guys remember when they won the Super Bowl, that defense led the league in sacking the quarterback. They've fallen off a little bit right there. And you lose Antonio Pierce, which is one of their linebackers, and all of a sudden you add a playmaker that can get to the quarterback off the edge. This was a good get by those guys. Another energizer bunny from Georgia Tech. He's the prototype defensive end who also could play outside rush linebacker. I love his burst off the edge. I think he's better on the right, on the left side against the right defensive tackle. But the thing I love about him, he plays every snap hard, and he's got that quick burst off the edge. With the 16th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Tennessee Titans select Derek Morgan, defensive end, Georgia Tech. but this kid is solid as a rock. And also, people close to Tim Tebow are getting a strong sense that Denver could be where he ends up. We've seen a lot of trades from the Broncos here. They're in position to perhaps take him if he's there. Strong probability it could happen. With the 17th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the San Francisco 49ers select Mike Ayupati, offensive guard, Idaho. Lineman. The only negative, he's one of those grabbers. In the bowl game, I counted six holding penalties, not calling all of them in the first half. The
The same thing happened at the Senior Bowl. He grabs, but coach, when he gets up in that hole, it's like bowling pins going everywhere. And when we come back, it's going to be the Pittsburgh Steelers on the clock. With the 18th pick in the 2010 draft, the Pittsburgh Steelers select Marquise Punsey, center from Florida. training camp, immediately play. He's big enough to anchor. He's athletic enough to pull. I think he's an absolutely great selection for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Marquis bouncy, snapped the football. Great extension. Can sit at that big butt down and anchor against the 34 nose tackle. Loved watching him compete with Dan Williams. Tebow, bang, right up the middle. Great job on the quarterback draw. There's, I'm sorry, Rich. Go no, ahead. It's no problem. And uh, Tim Tebow draft party watching his center, the guy who uh, was right in front of him for all of those. What do you think about that? Where's, Jim, where's Jimmy Clausen? I is, hear you. Is Tim Tebow going to go ahead of Jim Clausen? Maybe we talk, so. We talked about that in our production meeting yesterday. There's a possibility that that could happen. Steve, what do you think? I think Josh McDaniels feels that he can coach a quarterback and be successful in his scheme. Now, they've got they've got some guys. Didn't Brady Quinn just show up? They've got some people over there. Uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's accumulating a lot of draft picks. He's got somebody in mind to go up and target. I like that last pick, though, Rich. Marquise Pouncey, because Gert Guy. Well, we're, looking at, we're looking at the Falcons' war room where Mike uh, Smith just hung up the phone, perhaps with their newest Atlanta Falcon. They're shaking hands. I really thought they were hoping to get Pouncey because their center, McClure, is in his 12th year. Pouncey's not there. So they're, it's going to be somebody safe. A Demarius Thomas, perhaps. Dan Williams, perhaps. Okay, so there you go. Dan Williams, perhaps that guy, or... With the 19th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Atlanta Falcons select Sean Weatherspoon, linebacker, Missouri. That's really a good fit for them. Weatherspoon, explosive linebacker, 239 pounds, can play the Mike or Will. Thought he had an excellent senior bowl week, which really elevated his status. He's got great range, tremendous production. He's a three-down linebacker. And with Mike Peterson being 34 years old, Steven Nicholas average at the will position, he immediately upgrades the linebacker position. I think Des Bryant could be off the board with the next pick at 21 to Cincinnati. With this pick in Houston, they've got a huge need for corner. They lost Dante Robinson to free agency. Kyle Wilson, my sixth best available player, I believe becomes a Houston Texan. Don't they need a running back as well? Couldn't there? What, what two running, running back backs, could they go Two for? running backs are off the board. You can yeah. look at a job in best, the best but would be the only logical guy. But they're really, right now, they're light at the corner position because of Dante Robinson. You know, they've got Bryce McCain and Molden competing for a job opposite Glover Quinn. Not exactly household names. And they were the number one passing team on offense in the National Football League. A job at best would help them in the run game and put them out there a little bit like C.J. Spiller. But, but Kyle Wilson is more of a need. This guy went over there from New Jersey because of that blue turf, Rich. That's a, that's a recruiting tool. When you're number one in offense, what do you, what do you fix? You fix the defense. defense. <laughs> and guess what? They, they've tried to draft guys on the defensive line. They get pressure at times. Right. They need guys that when you don't get pressure, right. what do you do? You convert. Right. Right. And here's the other thing, Coach. Job at best, I don't think, is a good compliment to Steve Slayton. You already got that kind of guy. You want to get a Toby Gerhardt or a Montario Hardesty or a Ben Tate, a big downhill guy. Which they could very well in get the in the second, second round. round. Yeah. Exactly. With the 20th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Houston Texans select Kareem Jackson, defensive back, Alabama. That makes sense. Hey? We're talking about the corner need. Kareem Jackson's one of the most technique sound guys in this draft. 5'10 and a half, 196. Ran a better 40 than people anticipated. A sub 4'5. He's very physical, technically sound, fast 
Rock's rising junior. He played extremely well. You know if you're a defensive back coming out of Nick Saban's system, you're technically proficient. Good change of direction. Ran better than people expected. And between him and Kyle Wilson, they're different kind of players, but they're both fairly physical. And I'll tell you what, this kid will tackle you. Yeah, you see right there. You look at him and you see he has, to, he has good feet. I think a little, he's high, Mike, on his turns yeah. and everything. Now, Reggie Wayne, he's going over there with Reggie Wayne. And I know Reggie Wayne. Reggie Wayne will use that against him. He'll have to get a little lower to play guys like Reggie Wayne. Again, he's not a man-to-man -man by himself all day corner. He's better in press coverage where he can get up and play with you a little bit. He's physical, he's instinctive and tough. The only other cornerback the Texans have ever taken in the first round was Dante Robinson. And as we know, he left via free agency this particular offseason. All right, so now the Bengals are 21. We know Chad was clamoring for T.O. throughout this particular uh, free agency period. They got Antonio Bryant anyway. They need a tight end. I mean, that's been, the, that's been no telling details out of school. And with this tall, humongous tight end in Gresham, you think they may still go Des Bryant anyway? I gave him Gresham in my in my mock draft, but Des Bryant was off the board by there. I'm telling you right now, there. I think there's been some arguing going on in that building because Gresham fits a need. There's no question about it. However, remember, they took Chase Kaufman, the tight end from Missouri, in the third round a year ago. And Des Bryant paired with TJ and the rest of that group, it's explosive. Denver, I believe, we believe, has just struck a trade. McDaniels with his old boss. So go figure that Belichick's going to start moving down a draft board. And with all of these draft picks that Denver has amassed uh, in the early parts of this first round, apparently Denver is now trading up. And Denver is on the clock at 22 overall. With the 21st pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Cincinnati Bengals select Jermaine Gresham, tight end, Oklahoma. And there's Jermaine Gresham, Mike. Big, big, tall, tight end. And missed his entire season this year. 6'5", 261. Runs a 4'6", 940. He can jump, he can run. He's a tremendous vertical threat. I believe to be a pro bowl caliber tight end, he's got to improve his inline blocking skills. He's not an H-back. I'll tell you though, the combine was impressive, but at Sam Bradford's pro day, not only did Bradford show off his stuff, this young man ran the whole route tree. He caught everything. He's explosive. He's a hands catcher. Yep. And the two biggest games he had were the national championship game in 08, where he lit it up 13 catches, 152 yards against Florida and Texas. They're pretty big numbers. And like another that. Oklahoma Sooner goes off the board. Fourth. And what I like about the kid is he understands that in traffic, you buy the ball, buy the ball. but he also has the ability to catch the ball with his hands above his head. A lot of guys don't understand the technique. Go ahead and take it, Michael. Yeah. I know you wanted to say that. No, but we talked about that, Marshall. We talked about that. And those are the guys. And he played wide receiver in high school. So he learned how to catch it outside and how to make sure when I'm inside in that traffic to hold on to that ball. Great pick as the guy headed by Mark Draft. So, guys, so Denver, which started at 11 and then moved down to 13 and then moved down to 24, has just popped up to 22 to take who? I don't think it's Dez. Yes. It could be Dez or Demarius Thomas. Either one of those two would make sense coming off the board right now. Well, Thomas Demarius. is not on the phone. Dez Bryant was not in the picture. Tim I'm Tebow's not sure not they moves. want to deal with another issue right after they showed Brandon Marshall the door. This kid is a big physical wide out that runs in the 4-4 range. He broke his foot training for the combine. He's an unknown because of the offense he played, but he's a great character kid. And I really believe, Jason Lock and Fora, that the pick for the Broncos is Demarius Thomas. And with the 22nd pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Denver Broncos select Demarius Thomas, wide receiver, Georgia Tech. 
So Brandon Marshall out, Demarius Thomas in, as Josh McDaniels continues to remake the Denver Broncos along with his GM, Brian Sanders. Six foot three, 224 pounds. He caught 46 passes and averaged 25 yards a catch. Now, that's not really representative because he got a lot of single coverage because of the offense they run with the option attack. However, I give Denver a ton of credit. And Rich, I want you to get on this right now, Rich. What has Denver accumulated so far with all their trade downs? Remember, they started at 11, right? Well, how many draft picks have they put together to drop down to this spot and get Demarius Thomas, one of the most explosive guys in this draft, who they wanted from the very beginning. Well, they got three draft picks in the move downs, and they just gave one back up. So they've net two. Up, right. They've net two, and uh, they have this wide receiver that they couldn't really take at 11, right? I mean, that would have been a quote-unquote reach. Yep. At 22, they get the value in Demarius Thomas. And here's why I give them credit. It's a very difficult decision to meet. Booch talked about the difficulty in evaluating a wide receiver that doesn't run a route tree. You compound that with the medical issues of the foot injury training for the combine. So nobody's timed him in the 40. Nobody's put him through a shuttle drill. He hasn't had any kind of pass catching drills at full speed. And you can't see him on tape run a route tree. With the 23rd pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Green Bay Packers select Brian Bulaga, offensive tackle, Iowa. Well, I mean, at 23, that's an incredible value pick, to use that phrase that we hear so much, Mike. Yeah, and with Clifton and Tauscher, the two starters, there's a great sigh of relief. Look at that, look at that big blockhead. <laughs> I mean, that is the face of Iowa right there, folks. Midwest guy, he belongs look at that. in Green Bay. too much and that guy's the, the guy to do it for the next 12 years if, if there was ever a guy whose head you want to put a big piece of cheese on <laughs> that's the one right there look at that look at that <laughs> that's a lot of size and relief right there he's got a tremendous six inch punch really strong people question his arm length it's only about 33 inches and robert gallery took a lot of heat a couple years ago because of that but he'll be a very solid addition to the Green Bay offensive line. And the nice thing, Mooch, he might not have to play day one at left tackle. At left tackle. Exactly. Either, you know, if, if Tauscher is healthy, Mark Tauscher on the right side is a very good tackle. He just has some injury concerns. But I think this guy is going to be the third swing tackle, right. be able to back them both up initially, and then find himself a home. And Jimmy Clausen is still out there along with Dez Bryant. And I don't think either would, you think either of these would go to the Patriots right now at 24? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say the next two picks in this draft are Dez Bryant to the New England Patriots, paired with Randy Moss. Are you kidding me? A trade? Here we are. The Dallas Cowboys have there just it is. left up. The Cowboys, Stephen Jones getting a little excited as Jerry just gets off the phone, handing it around. The NFL.com draft tracker presented by Lexus. Follow all 32 teams on NFL.com. We know what that is. And you said earlier tonight that the Cowboys wanted to trade up and make a big splash. As the Patriots have traded down now for the second time, and the Cowboys are on the clock with a minute and 40 seconds. You think this is Des Bryant? Well, you know what? I talked to Jerry, and I, I know he wanted to make a splash. He said it. He said, I'm not sitting, Pat, where we are right now. I want to bring somebody in to continue to help this team grow. We were not there. Now, he also talked about that offensive line and the way it got destroyed in Minnesota. He also said he wanted some help there, but, boy, call Jerry. He said he Brian just would be good right here. Call him and say what you got there, boy. He only had some phone got photographers busted out in the Des Bryant draft party. Oh, boy. They're hopping up and down. Hey. And it is possible that the folks in DeSoto, Texas have just heard As that I Dallas, see. Texas is going to be the professional home of Des Bryant, a target for Tony Romo with Miles Austin, wow. with Roy Williams, with Jason Witten, right down the street from Prosper 
Texas and Dion I talked about this. <laughs> Rich, we talked about this in the pregame. Jerry, I don't think he's ever gotten over some of the things that Randy Moss did to the Dallas Cowboys when he came in that stadium because he wanted to be a Cowboy. They never took him as he continued to fall. Jerry doesn't want to make that same mistake and let this guy, this kind of talent, get away. With the 24th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Dallas Cowboys select Dez Bryant, wide receiver, Oklahoma State. So again, Dez Bryant, a young man from Texas from a very hard scrabble upbringing, is playing for the Dallas Cowboys. And New England drops down just three more spots and gets Dallas's 90th pick overall. he made the last two years. He's got a top five skill set, but he's going to have to grind him off the field now. you got to work hard with him off the field. If you do that, you've got a pro ball wide receiver. And the Cowboys also get a fourth round pick from New England, the 119th pick overall as the uh, Oklahoma State Cowboy becomes a Dallas Cowboy, and he's already got the headgear to prove it. And the Cowboys have been trying to find that replacement, that long-term great receiver since Michael Irvin. They tried T.O. for a while. They tried Roy Williams last year. All of a sudden, here comes a new kid on the block. Welcome back to the 75th NFL Draft. Tim Tebow is on the phone in his house with the Denver Broncos. And he is going to be, after all is said and done, a first-round pick out of Florida in the NFL Draft. Is going to be joining Josh McDaniels' group with Brady Quinn and Kyle Orton. And Tim Tebow is going to be a Denver Bronco and a first round pick. A winner will emerge from the two quarterbacks that compete, Brady Quinn or Kyle Orton. And then a year to two years from now, that young man will challenge him for a spot. And look at the look at the look at the price that they paid to go up and get him a two, a three, wow. and a four, which means Denver Denver still holds on to. Uh, it's 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 remarkable how much they gave up to get. They must that, believe in the that guy. That was very expensive to go get him ahead of Jimmy Clausen, ahead of Colt McCoy. They have plans for this guy now. Kyle Orton will be their player, their quarterback, because he's a good quarterback. Here comes the commissioner. And let's hear the words that few people thought would ever be heard on the first night of an NFL draft. Baltimore has traded the 25th pick to Denver. And with the 25th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Denver Broncos select Tim Tebow, quarterback, Florida. And congratulations to that young man who did not lose his composure one bit as he was picked apart limb from limb, figuratively, at the combine and not throwing there and, of course, the senior bowl. But he's a first-round draft choice all said and done, Mike. Congratulations to Tim Tebow. Six, two, and three quarters, 236 pounds. He's a physical specimen. Off the chart in tangibles. Again, redshirt him at least once, maybe redshirt him twice. I want that kind of kid in my huddle and in my building leading my franchise. I believe in the kid. And if you want to talk about athletic ability, he ran a 6-6-6, three cone. That's better than almost any wide receiver or corner at the combine. This is an athletic, tough kid that will compete down the road for the Denver Broncos. We, we talked about it in the um, pre-draft show, almost a pre-game show, in the pre-draft show, that wherever this guy goes, it has to be a head coach that's an offensive coordinator, an offensive-minded head coach. Now, you're saying two years down the road. Interesting enough, interesting enough, the Denver Broncos bring in two high-character people. Oh, yeah. After they got rid of 
Brandon Marshall, setting a tone for this locker room. This is how we are playing football. But I wouldn't be surprised if Josh McDaniels get him some playing time in this so-called spread wildcat kind of an offense yep. this year. Absolutely yeah, agree I with agree. you, Michael, because, yeah, he can redshirt from the quarterback position, but find something for this guy to do. Get him on the grass, get him on the bus, and make him active on your 46. And maybe it's wildcat, maybe it's a little quarterback, but whatever it is, Josh will find a use for this guy because he's such a talent, and it's going to be a lot of fun watching this guy play this season as their third quarterback slash whatever. Give an opportunity to Josh. prove everybody wrong. Josh McDaniel sold his staff on his abilities to make a quarterback Absolutely. a quarterback. Yep. What he did with Orton, he believes That's cool. that he can turn Tim Tebow into the kind of quarterback as a passer that he needs to be. Winning, you can't teach winning, but you can teach a quarterback how to throw the football, how to read the defense, and how to make plays. He believes he can do that with Tim Tebow. He said it with Jay Culler. We can get anybody to do what he did, and he did it with Kyle Orton to a certain degree. The question is, can he do it with Tim Tebow? And I think he's in a perfect place where the head coach has his fingers on the quarterback position. His whole hand. Everything. And he's going to say, choking I'm going to be patient, I'm going to be diligent, defensive-minded coach that says, you better get something out of him or I'm going to send him out of here. Josh will be patient and he'll find a way to use him. It's just remarkable that the journey for Tim Tebow from Florida to the pros is now over. What else? What are we going to talk and complain about? I feel, I feel so thing, empty. Mike, and we know this. All of the hard work in the world ain't going to make you a good NFL player. Right. I mean, it'll give you an opportunity to compete. Things have to happen for Tim and deliver what a quarterback needs to do in the NFL. There's a lot of guys that work hard and just don't make it. He's got a two-step process here. The first is the mechanical piece. The second is the piece that every spread quarterback coming out of college football has to go through. Three-step, five-step, seven-step, reading progression, anticipating windows that aren't there but still throwing the football in anticipation. You don't get that coming out of college football much anymore. So, yeah, Marshall, I agree. He's got one more challenge than the normal first-round quarterback, though. And so it's no longer the Cutler-Brandon Marshall show. It could be the Tim Tebow-Demarius Thomas show for years to come. And Brady Quinn and uh, Kyle Orton are probably sitting at home right now going, what is up with that? When you got the call, uh, who was on the phone? Take me through that moment. Well, uh, they called, and I go, Jimmy, it's like 3.03, should I answer? And he was like, yeah. He's like, definitely. He got all excited. He goes, yeah, <laughs> should you answer? answer it. And so I, I answered it, and it was Coach McDaniel. He's like, hey, this is Coach McDaniel. Was, hey, Coach, how you doing? Trying to act calm and cool. And so he, just, he actually started small talking for a little bit. And so then, and then after a little bit, he goes, well, we're traded up, and we're going to take you. And uh, so I just said, thank you so much. And he said, just promise me that everything that, that you're about, everything that we've talked about that's what you're, we're going to get and I, I, t I promise him that's exactly what you're going to get nothing less and um, so then he said go enjoy the moment. Tim you're going to try and become a great NFL quarterback a couple of the best in our business Tom Brady and Peyton Manning when they were drafted they knew they were in for something special in their pro careers Tom Brady went to Bob Kraft the owner of the Patriots and said you made one of the best decisions ever picking me Peyton Manning told the Colts before he was drafted if you don't take me I'm going to kick your butt for a decade now that you've been picked what do you have to say to Denver who believes in you and everyone else who passed on you well I have to say to Denver is thank you and I'm going to give everything um in my heart, in my head, in my soul uh, to that organization and try to help that organization as much as I can. And I'm just looking forward uh, to the challenge of the NFL and playing in the NFL. It's a dream come true for me. And, uh, and just to all the, the critics and stuff, just thank you for the motivation because it truly has been a lot of motivation. And uh, I truly believe that has been an edge for me and it will continue to be an edge for me. Tim, congratulations. All the best in Denver. Thank you so much. All God right, bless. Tim Tebow, Denver Broncos quarterback. With the 26th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Arizona Cardinals select Dan Williams, defensive tackle, Tennessee. Too good a player. They had a need at corner. They had a big need at corner. They had a big need at linebacker. But they went and they trusted their board. This is way too good a football player to fall all the way down to number 26. That's 
a great job by the Arizona Cardinals. Rod Graves, Steve Kime, Coach Wisenhunt entrusting their board. Are on the clock right now, having moved down twice. So Denver could move up to pick Demarius Thomas, and the Cowboys could pick, move up to pick Des Bryant right before the Broncos would pop back into the first round, giving up a two, three, and a four. The logic coming into this draft is that for sure Jimmy Clausen would go before Tim Tebow, and that wasn't the case. Tim Tebow just went to the Denver Broncos moments ago. And we talked about that possibility yesterday. Could it happen? Could all of a sudden Clausen fall? So far that either Colt McCoy or Tebow jumps ahead, it happened. I think we're all kind of stunned by yeah. it. I feel badly for Jimmy Clausen a little bit, and I'm wondering whether or not Minnesota's still sitting there saying, that's our guy. be interesting to see. That would be a good place for him. I think he'd be a terrific in that West Coast offense, but this is the first time ever that two Heisman Trophy quarterbacks were in the same draft, and they both went in the first round. Very unusual. As we talk about Tim Tebow, though, guys, and Marshall, you mentioned this kind of... Can you imagine what happens with Josh McDaniels and his stock if he takes Tim Tebow and makes him a real NFL quarterback? With the 27th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the New England Patriots select Devin McCourty, defensive back, Rutgers. His official time was a 4-4-1. Most scouts had him in the mid-4-3s. He may be the best special teams player in the entire draft. He's a return guy that's a gunner and a jammer. He's sudden, quick, and physical. He'll compete for some time in your nickel and dime coverage. He's actually longer than his height would suggest. Some people, I think he's a little bit tight in transition. You can tell right there how long his legs are. A little tight coming out of some of his turns, but he'll compete. And you know Bill Belichick, they're always cognizant and prioritize their special teams. And this guy had seven career blocks. He returned pumps and kicks for touchdowns. He's a starting outside player that might be able to kick inside. Just a very solid New England pick. He's also real good off the field. of the first round has just astounded me. As far as the Odrick pick, I've seen a lot of this kid play football. He played defensive tackle at Penn State. He's going to play defensive end for Miami. He's a natural five technique. He's almost 6'5". He's over 300 pounds. He'll line up head up against those massive offensive tackles in the NFL. He's got a great motor, heavy hands, and he's a guy that will start out as a rotational player with Kendall Langford, Randy Starks, Philip Merling, but ultimately will be a starter for the Miami Dolphins. With the 28th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Miami Dolphins select Jared Odrick, defensive tackle, Penn State. There's Odrick in the green room hugging his family. He's a Miami Dolphin, which leads, when we come back, to one of the more entertaining moments in all of NFL sports, when the Jets are on the clock. He's on the ground too much, and you don't like that with defensive linemen unless they're getting double teamed. But he, he's got to play with better consistent leverage. When he stays low, he's dominant. When he gets higher, tired and stands up, he tends to get pushed around a little bit. But boy, he's a, he's a, he lights up the room. He's a great kid. We're back in Radio City Music Hall. The chant of the J-E-T-S has been going on for eight minutes. You have to sit here and wonder. With Audric off the board, McCordy off the board, two guys that you thought that the Jets were interested in. With Jimmy Clausen still on the board and the Vikings up next, if the Jets might be in their war room, taking a lot of phone calls from people who are maybe trading up to get Jimmy Clausen, but there hasn't been much interest, it seems, so far for any teams to have the gumption to do that. 
because a lot of people believe the Vikings would take Lawson next. What do you think the Jets are doing right now, Mike? I think they're milking the clock. It's the classic four corners offense, hoping to get somebody to come up ahead of the Minnesota Vikings to take Jimmy Clausen. The Cleveland Browns would be logical, but the Cleveland Browns might be in the bar, bar looking for Colt McCoy. I mean, there's a lot. This is a situation that I've got the Vikings taking Jimmy Clausen in my mock draft, but I wasn't really sure he was going to fall that far. But Moosh, we said it yesterday. If he got past 17, he was going to free for all. Yeah, and I'm a little bit surprised. We've seen this before with Aaron Rodgers and Brady Quinn. Same thing happens now to another Notre Dame quarterback. I don't know that. Uh, I don't know that the Minnesota Vikings would benefit themselves by taking a quarterback. I think they're a few players away from a Super Bowl, and it's not the quarterback position. Well, the Jets are milking the clock. It's less than a minute to go, Marshall. It is. It is. And we talk. We talk pre-draft. is there, Sergio Kindle, the rush linebacker, is on the board. With the 29th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the New York Jets select Kyle Wilson, defensive back, Boise State. And we introduce the good people of New, uh, well, New York and New Jersey back to an old New Jersey kid who went to, went to uh, Boise State. Direction, tremendous burst, added value in the return game. Again, this is a kid that can play off man. He can play press man. You can line him up in the slot. Look at his quickness in his feet. He's fighting against a six foot five wide receiver, regained inside leverage, and made the play. Off man, watch his feet here. Patient pedal, runs the route for the receiver, cuts underneath, makes the play. Senior ball in the game. Pull the trigger. Pull the trigger. Get up. Get up. Make the tackle in the hole. Put his head and shoulder pads right in there. Excellent job of support. Does he understand zone concepts? Number one disappears. Now what happens? Watch the quarterback. Reads the ball. Just catch the ball, son. You did everything right to catch the football. Kyle Wilson is tremendous value. 29. So the Jet fans are enjoying their night here at Radio City. Three picks to go. The Vikings are on the clock. Could this be the time? Jimmy Clausen hears his name. If they want to go Clausen, they can, obviously. He's still there. But again, Steve, you keep saying you don't think that that's the move that a team that's so close to getting to the Super Bowl makes right now, certainly with uh, with Clausen not being ready. It makes sense. It's a good fit for the offense. I think he would be a terrific in the West Coast offense. But he wouldn't play this year. Uh, it, even if Brett doesn't play, I think they're going to go with Tavares Jackson or Sage Rosenfeld. So they're so close. Let's, you know, let's improve our defense. Let's take an area. Maybe it's corner or safety and let's find a guy that can play in the first game and maybe help us win that division and get home field advantage again and make another run. You know that Denver made a lot of picks to move down in a range where Tebow made sense and then ultimately moved up. Part of the reason I'm told is that Buffalo was putting together a package. They were maneuvering, talking to teams, trying to move back up into the first round. So ultimately, Denver decides they need to move up, be sure they get him. When Ozzie Newsom heard the offer, talked to someone in the Ravens draft room who said his eyes bugged out. He couldn't believe it, felt like he had to make the move. The Ravens get back everything they gave up for uh, Anquan Bolden, except they get the picks higher because they're Denver's picks. So Baltimore thought it was a can't-miss trade. Minnesota has traded its pick to Detroit, Whoa, and Jamin Best yeah. is on the phone. There he is. The Lions, as we know, have the second pick in tomorrow's second round, the first round of tomorrow. This would be a nice acquisition for the Lions. And Rich, if you remember, we talked about predictions and all that stuff, and one of teams that would move up and make it blip. I have felt all along Detroit was going to jump back into the first round to get a running back. They've got to get a running back because of the injury situation right there. And that's going to be the man. Javid Best provides a tremendous change of pace for them. I, I think it's an excellent job because he could have been off the board before they get back on. Exciting player, too. 
Minnesota has traded the 30th pick to the Detroit Lions. With the 30th pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Detroit Lions select Javid Best, running back, California. And it's easily one of the uh, best value players in this draft, presented by Golden Corral. There is Javid Best. He's a first round draft choice out of the Cal Bears, 30th overall to the Detroit Lions. And the Minnesota Vikings, in exchange, receive the second round choice of the Lions tomorrow. The uh, 100th overall, the fourth round pick of the Lions, and then 214 overall, which is their seventh round choice as well. Detroit also gets a 128th overall pick. That would be the fourth round choice of the Minnesota Vikings, and that is the way Javid Best becomes a lot. And what I love about this guy most, when you put off the, he can catch that pass over the shoulders. You can split this guy out wide, Marshall, and no one would be able to cover him. It would be a mixed match. Some of the things that I saw you do get out wide, Marshall, you cause problems for defenses. This kid can cause problems for defenses out wide with that over, with the ability to catch that over the shoulder pass. In a lot of ways, he's like C.J. Spiller. He can go the distance. He can be versatile in the return game and on offense. I tip my hat to Jeff Tedford over at Cal. He's got two first round Jeff draft choices. Tyson Palawalo went to the uh, Jags over there, a defensive tackle, and now you got Javid Best at running back going to Detroit. Good job, Cal Bears. I like this guy, and I like him more in the passing game because when we talk about running backs catching the football, is can you catch the football without seeing it leave the quarterback hands? I Wait like a receiver. Marshall. Can you locate the ball in the air and make the catch? Because we all can catch it when we see it come out of his hands. Right. He has the ability to catch the football out of the air when he sees it. A Detroit Lion, as you mentioned, Kevin Smith uh, hurt his, uh, he blew out his knee at the uh, towards the end of last year. Lions need a rock toter, and they got this young man from Cal. Is this guy, Javid Best, the best value that we've seen tonight? Or is Tim Tebow that that pick? I'd, I'd make some arguments there. I mean, job at best, I think, went about where he should have, somewhere between 27, 28, and 40 is about where I expected he would go. Do I think it was a great pick for them to move up and make sure they got this football player? Yes, I do. He complements what they do offensively, and I think for the D Detroit Lions, with Pettigrew with tight end, with what they've done at the wide receiver position, with what they've done at the quarterback position, yes. With the 31st pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the Indianapolis Colts select Jerry Hughes, defensive end, TCU. And boy, does Jerry Hughes look like an Indianapolis Colt. 6'1 yeah. and 3 quarters, 255, explosive off the edge. People are concerned about his height. That's not a concern of Bill Polian's. Explosive tweener. Is he an end or a linebacker? Well, in that one gap indie system, he's an end. He's explosive like Lamar Woodley. The question is, does he hold up against the run, given the size? He's a tough guy. Marshall Falk, you called it correctly a minute ago. What makes you think that he'd be such a great player for the I, Indianapolis? I, I looked at the board. This guy is a guy that, that's, a, that's a high motor. And if you think about it, they couldn't get pressure on Drew Brees. They need another guy. Kind of like what the Giants did. You might want to put four ends down, take a tackle out, rush the passer. They have to find a way to get pressure. They can't blitz you. They don't have the DBs right. to do that. So the New Orleans Saints are all that's left in the very first primetime NFL draft. Son of New Orleans, what do you think they're going to do with this final pick of the first round? It's interesting. I mean, it, they have they have a bunch of ways that they can go. When you look at offensive line, they could use a couple of interior linemen. They're starting five. They're good. They lost Jamal Brown. Um, they need a pass rush. They need another pass rush. But I think the most pressing need is safety on the back end. You have to get a safety, especially if you're not going to sign Darren Sharper. You need to get another guy back there. You like Taylor Mays there? I like Taylor Mays, and they like USC guys. It would not surprise me if they take Taylor Mays. They need some linebacker help also. A 4-3 will linebacker. Scott Shanley's got a year left on his contract. The fastest outside linebacker TCU. in this draft from TCU, Darryl 
Washington, to me, has New Orleans Saints written all over him. The kind of player the Saints love. You're right. He gets around. He's always around the ball. Fast guy. Flies. Loves to get Long. to the ball. Flies really to long. the ball. To announce the New Orleans Saints selection, please welcome the most valuable player from Super Bowl 44, Drew Brees. First off, I'd like to thank the fans for voting me as one of the top 75 draft picks of all time, as well as voting me onto the cover of Madden NFL 11. And with that, with the 32nd pick in the 2010 NFL Draft, the New Orleans Saints select Patrick Robinson, defensive back, Florida State. Okay, that concludes the first round of the 2010 draft. Thank you for making history with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow night at 6 o'clock for rounds 2 and 3. So good night, everybody. Thank you. Of course, we're not going anywhere. And you got to love it. He's a Super Bowl MVP. He's the Madden cover boy. He's one of the nicest players in the NFL. But if you beat the Jets and Giants, you get booed here. What about this guy, Patrick Robinson? I told you, sweet feet, 5'11", 190. That 40-yard dash is really not reflective of what he is. He's a 4'4 guy. He's the most naturally gifted cornerback in this draft, but he's inconsistent both with his physicality and his technique. Now, when I watched him against North Carolina, he looked like a top 12 or 14 pick. When I watched him against BYU and Boston College, I don't want him in the first two rounds. That's how different a player he was just on those three takes. As a sophomore, he had six interceptions, only one interception since then. The easy way to say, ah, oh, you can throw away from a corner. That wasn't the deal. People were beating him off the line of scrimmage, and he's much more talented than that. I look for them to coach him hard to raise his level of play. Marshall, you said it earlier, sometimes in college you can skate with natural ability. It'll be interesting to see whether he raises up or just stays down here. Good night to all of you for being part of our NFL draft coverage of the very first primetime NFL draft, the 75th draft. We will see you tomorrow night for rounds two and three. Good, saying bring that up good night about Miami. from Radio City. My apologies, Michael. Okay, thank you, Rich. Appreciate it.